Give him praise this morning. I'm Shane Rushton, pastor here at Chinook Bible Church in Pincher Creek, Alberta. And uh, we just wanted to take a few minutes and share with you a bit of what's going on here in Chinook and some of the new projects that are coming up and share our heart towards those projects. One of the projects, one of the main projects we're starting here in 2022 is the Adopt a Family Project. Uh, and we've really been praying about ways that we can help out in our community, in our area, to those that are less fortunate, uh, those that in these rough times are struggling, finding it hard to make ends meet and and feed their children and just, just find themselves discouraged and, and downhearted. We believe that it is really the church's responsibility to reach into the community and help those in need and help those less fortunate. And we appreciate the government programs that are available. We appreciate uh, charitable organizations that do help these families. But unfortunately, a lot of these families fall through the cracks and really don't get the help they deserve. But we here at Chinook have been so blessed and God has just poured out on us in such an abundant way that we feel it's our responsibility to, to reach out and help those that are in need. To that end, we've started this project, as I said, the Adopt a Family Project, and really what it is, in, in essence, is each month <clears throat> we are going to take submissions on some families in need, and and uh, on the page that you're viewing, there's a, a submission form and link that you can go to and submit either a family that you know or yourself, and uh, and there's details there that we ask for, such as you know how many kids there are, their ages, uh, dietary restrictions, uh, clothing sizes, uh, special needs, you know, such as prescriptions and things like this. Because we just want to help out. We just want to uh, give you or a family you know uh, a hand up and, and and a lift and an encouragement in this time. And oftentimes, a church's vision becomes so expansive um, where we are looking overseas at other countries that are struggling in other countries where there's just high poverty rates and, and, and we send so many resources there to those nations. Good morning everyone. Nice to have everybody here. I know there's more coming in so that's good but we're going to get started in worshiping the Lord. We want to welcome everyone that's watching online this morning. Welcome to our service. I just our heart's desire is that you will be able to enter in in such a powerful and mighty way as if you were even here in in with worshiping with us. And I know the Lord wants to do some mighty good things today. He wants to, us to hear his voice. 
Listen for him and his calling and what he has for us in this place and the ones watching online. God is a big God. He can reach us wherever we are. He can be with us in any room of any house or any place. He knows us. He knows where we're at. And he loves us so much. So let's just open in a word of prayer this morning. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We worship you this morning. That's why we are here, to worship in your presence. God, we know there is no other God but you. You are the one true living God. And we praise your holy name. We praise you for answers. We praise you for the things, Lord God, that you have in store for us. Plans for us, Lord, to succeed and be successful to prosper us in all that we do. Father, we give you praise for that this morning. We just rejoice. The joy of the Lord is our strength today. And Lord, we bask in that and we just speak and declare your joy in our life today. We thank you, Lord, that as we worship and praise your holy name, Lord God, oh, Father, mighty things are coming streaming in. They're coming in. Lord God, we give you all the praise and all the glory. Oh, hallelujah. Let us worship you in spirit and in truth. We know your presence is very powerful. And we thank you, Lord, today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's just begin our worship time this morning. Your holy Jesus. Let's just take a moment in his presence this morning. Thank you, Jesus. You reign forevermore. There's nobody like you, Jesus. There's nobody like you, Jesus. You are worthy, Jesus. 
King of kings, Lord of all, oh, you are my King, King of kings, Lord of Lord, I worship you. Oh, lift your hands and give them glory this morning. Lift up your voice and give them all the praise. Oh 
We declare that each one of us in this room, each one of us watching online, declare him this morning as your greatness, as, his, as your great God, your personal Savior who lives in you, who abides in you, who will never leave you nor forsake you. That's who you declare who he is this morning. He is your living God exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think that's the God who we serve this morning amen yes. hallelujah father we worship and we praise you this morning Lord we thank you you are exceeding abundantly above all above all that we could ask or think we are filled with your glory this morning we are filled in the presence of the Holy Ghost Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. Oh, we praise you, Jesus. Let it flow out of us this morning. Let worship just flow from every being in this place. Lord, let's not ever, ever forget who you are in our lives. You are our healer. You are our deliverer from anything, from everything. You are our source of supply. Jesus, I thank you that amongst any disease or sickness or, or challenges in our life, you are God Almighty. You are I am. I am is here this morning. I am lives in us this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's not forget the power of the anointing of Jesus. Oh, Father, we love you. We love you. We love you. We know the enemy would like to destroy your people. We know what he's trying to do. But God, we refuse to bow to anything that doesn't belong to us. We refuse to bow to sickness and disease. It doesn't belong in us. Oh, hallelujah. We are healed by the stripes of Jesus and we will not forget it. Oh, hallelujah. We've been redeemed. We've been set free. Jesus is Lord of our life. Oh, I praise you this morning. I praise you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, this week might be full of new challenges, but God, we rise up. We rise up by faith and we say we will conquer. We will conquer with Jesus at our side. Oh, hallelujah. We walk with favor this morning. We walk in the presence of Almighty God. 
No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Oh, we praise you, Lord. We are moving on. We're moving into great victory, great things in store for our families, for our children, for our church. Great things in store for the people of God, the ones who love, the ones who serve you, the ones who said, I will not bow to anything but you, Jesus. Father, we praise you this morning. You are the one true living God. And we rejoice in you. We rejoice in you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. You are more precious than soon. your hands forward this morning hallelujah father we thank you for your presence go ahead lift up your voice and just thank him this morning we thank you for your presence we thank you for your touch we thank you lord for the gifts that you have bestowed on us and as we do week by week and day by day we just declare your blessings on every gift that has been given father we send it into your kingdom multiply it as it goes multiply it to your will and to your work we father we just declare souls are saved through this and seeds that are sown just grow into great harvests and we pray your blessing on the giver on the holder on the the receiver where it goes we just declare your blessing father we know that we wouldn't have to give but you gave to us first and so we're just giving back what you gave to us bless it bless it Bless it in the name of Jesus. Somebody just declare it. I declare a blessing in Jesus' name. Multiply it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Amen as you're seated. Isn't God good? Amen. Some of you almost sounded like you believed it for a second there. Amen. He's such a good God. Just really quickly, we'll go through some announcements this morning. Don't forget, service every week at 10, 945, we come together and just worship. Uh, connections every Thursday at 7, be there for that. You'll be blessed by that, I promise you. Uh, don't forget our adoptive family project. Um, 
we have new sheets on the table in the back there for the family for May. And uh, <clears throat> the family for May is, is in real, real need, so just let God speak to your heart on that. There is a list there of kind of more specific um, things that they need to minister into their life. Don't forget that today I ate Pepsi slash Tim Hortons tin. And the t- day I ate Dave slash Goff. Either way, it gets to them. Amen. So don't forget that as well. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, tomorrow night at 7 is ladies' night. And so make sure you ladies are there for that. Hallelujah. Can we just give the Lord an offering of praise again this morning? Hallelujah. Let's just do it. Let's just take 30 seconds and just lift up our voices to him and let him know how much we love him. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. Mm. You are so wonderful, God. You are so wonderful, God. Hallelujah. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. And what I want to talk about this morning is what I learn, everyone say, what I learn in the fire. What I learn in the fire. There's lessons, everyone say there's lessons that God teaches us in moments where the enemy thinks he's defeating us. Hallelujah. There are moments in our lives that the enemy feels like he's beating us down and he's setting us up for disaster and he's setting us up for failure. But when the enemy thinks he's setting us up for failure, God is setting us up for future. Hallelujah. When the enemy thinks that he's bringing something in your life or he's setting up circumstances in your life, to pull the rug out from under you, what he discovers is that underneath the rug that he has pulled, God has built a foundation that cannot be shaken or moved by anything that he tries to do. And so God often uses those moments. First step, God didn't bring that moment, but God can use that moment. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Amen. So if there's something disastrous taking place in your life or something bad taking your li- place in your life, don't point your fingers northward. God does not send evil. God takes evil and turns it for your good. Can somebody lift your hands and give God praise? Hallelujah. That is, that is an, incredible, uh, an incredible misnomer that has been placed in the hearts and minds of people that God will use evil and put evil in your life to teach you a lesson. What a, what a misrepresentation of the love of our Father. No wonder people say, I don't want that kind of God. If God does A, B, C, and D, I don't want to serve that kind of God because he's not that kind of God. Hallelujah. I've often asked the question, and it's, it's, a, it's a serious and extreme question, but it's a valid question in relationship to the misnomer that people and the misjudgment that people have of who our Father is. If you had a child, if you had a child that was misbehaving and you had a child that was making bad decisions, as their loving parent, would you look at them and say, They need to learn to make better decisions. So I'm going to put cancer in their body. Cause them to suffer for year after year after year. And hopefully they'll learn something from it. Does that sound like something a loving father would do? No. A loving father looks at what the enemy is putting in their life. And says I'm going to use that and teach them. That when they rely on me. They can overcome this. Not be bound by by this. Can somebody say amen? So I want to talk about some things that we learn in the fire. Daniel chapter 3 
And we're going to start at verse 16. Probably a silly question, but how many knows the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? (laughs) We got one about halfway back over here doesn't know it, so we're going to have to share it from the beginning. (laughs) In express detail, just to make sure. The Reader's Digest version is this. Nebuchadnezzar built an idol, a statue of himself, and he called all people to come and surrender their worship to this statue. And the Bible says there were three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that refused to bow down and worship the statue or pay homage to the statue because they knew that only one deserved their praise. And they also knew, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, they also understood that once you surrender your worship and surrender your praise and remove it from its rightful place and surrender it into this world and surrender it to the idols of this world, you have lost the battle. That is the weaponry that you use to defeat the enemy. And so they refused to bow. And the Bible says that the king, because he had already placed them in a position of authority, and he favored them, so he called them in to give them a second chance. You know, maybe you didn't hear the announcement, maybe you didn't get the email, but if you don't bow before this statue and pay worship to it, you're going to be cast into a fiery furnace. Now watch in verse 16, watch the answer that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gives the king. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. We don't have to have a discussion because there is no negotiation. What an, awesome, what an awesome response. There's no negotiating. There is nothing you are going to tell me that's going to change my mind because I know that that God has ears but he can't hear, eyes and he can't see, a hand and he can't reach, feet and he can't walk with me. I will not surrender my worship to something that is dead. No, we serve a living God. So there's no point in us having a conversation about this because we will not bow. Can I stop there and tell you that sometimes we spend so much time negotiating with the enemy and negotiating with the things that he has put in our lives that we think we have discussions and we have to talk about it. Well, what if I give in on this? And what if I do this this way? What if I do this this way? Sometimes when the enemy comes in, we need to just stand up and say, this is not a discussion. You ever had to look at your child and say, this is not a negotiation? Sometimes you have to look at the enemy and you have to declare to him, this is not room for discussion. This is not a place where I negotiate and I tell you, okay, I'll accept this sickness for a while because maybe I need to learn something from it or I accept this and I'll just live this because maybe it's my lot in life. It's not your lot in life. Your lot in life is to receive everything that God has made for you. Look at the one beside you and say, it's not a discussion. We have no need to answer you in this matter. Watch verse 17. Hallelujah. If that is the case, he's talking talking about being thrown into the furnace because the king said, if you don't bow, you're being thrown into the furnace. So their response is in verse 17, if that is the case, our God whom we serve is able... Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. I know that's simple, but imagine the moment that it's being spoken. 
It's easy for us as a group of believers in here on a Sunday morning with the presence of God here to sing, he's able, oh, he's able. God is able to do everything that he has promised that he could do. Don't give up on God because he won't give up on you. But when you're standing in front of a king who has just told you, if you don't bow, you're going into the furnace, it's a little bit trickier sometimes to be able to still stand and declare, even if that's true, even if you do throw us into the furnace, our God whom we serve is able to deliver. Somebody lift up your hands and give God praise. Hallelujah. He says he is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand. Hallelujah. How many hears the phrase worst case scenario way too often? Don't we do that? Don't we have a habit sometimes in conversations? Well, what's going on in your life? Well, this, 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 and this. Well, what's, what's the outcome? Well, worst case scenario. We're funny people. We talked about this last week when we talked about receiving a miracle. We follow the exact opposite process that Jesus followed when he went and raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus first talked to the father, second talked to the problem, two, the problem, third talked to the people. We talk to the people about the problem and worst case scenario, we go to God. When everything else doesn't work, we go to God. And we use the phrasing, worst case scenario, you know, if, if everything goes wrong, this is what my life will look like in three months. And sometimes we even do it with a smile. Imagine that craziness. If everything falls apart and nothing works out, worst case scenario, this will happen, and I've survived worse. But to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, worst case scenario equaled best case scenario. Worst case scenario changed nothing. Everyone say it changed nothing. Hallelujah. The idea to them of being free to worship or cast into the furnace because they refused to worship the idol that the king had set up changed nothing in their understanding of who their God was. Was. Can I stop there and tell you this morning, the one thing that will keep you no matter what comes this way is really understanding who's here fighting this way. And when you remember that God doesn't change, circumstances do not change how you believe in your God. When you understand that mountains become plains at the mention of his name, then nothing can move you and shake you and cause you to turn back. Because worst case scenario, God delivers me. Can somebody give God praise? Hallelujah. Worst case scenario, if that is the case, and you throw us into the furnace. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. And he will. Everyone say, and he will. Oh, hallelujah. It's, it's great understanding that he can. It's great understanding that he has the ability. It's life changing to know that he is willing to use that ability and desires to deliver you out of the hand of the enemy. One of the first questions that was ever asked of Jesus of a sick person was, I know you can, but if you will make me whole. And Jesus said, I will be thou made whole. He will deliver. Everyone say he will deliver. But if not, let it be known. So here's the, here's the, the, the discussion. All right, if we don't bow, you say you're going to throw us in the furnace. Well, if that's the case, our God, whom we serve, 
is able to deliver us out of that furnace and will deliver us out of your hand. Now verse 18, heads up, if you decide not to throw us in the furnace, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Oh, hallelujah. Everyone say that's confidence. That's confidence. That's a confidence of understanding that you serve a God and you have a Father that will not let you down. It's understanding that you serve a Father who is able to keep you and deliver you. Did you get that? He's able to keep you and deliver you. You say, well, I've been praying for deliverance from this situation for six months and it feels like I'm still in it. Well, guess what? He's able to keep you and deliver you. But make no mistake about it. The end game is to deliver you. The end game is for you to come out of it better than you were when you went into it because you walked through it with God. Could somebody give him praise? Hallelujah. What a declaration. If you throw us in, he'll deliver us from the fire, then from your hand. If you don't throw us in, make no mistake about it, we still don't serve your gods. We still won't worship the image, and we will worship the Lord our God. God, can somebody just take a second and lift up your hand and give him praise this morning? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And then, because they made that declaration, the king changed his mind and everything was smooth sailing. Because we all know, we all know the minute we declare our trust in God, the devil surrenders and quits fighting. <laughs> oh, wait. The Bible says the king turned up the furnace seven times hotter. I don't know how he did that without a thermostat. That's beyond my understanding. But somehow, they stoked the fire of the furnace so it was seven times hotter. One translation says, seven times hotter than it wanted to be. <laughs> In other words, seven times hotter than that furnace was supposed to hold. And the Bible says that the king's men took the children of Israel, took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Hebrew children, and took them up to cast them into the furnace. Now, there's something really interesting here that takes place. Verse number 22 of chapter 3. Everyone say it was seven times hotter. <laughs> oh, praise God. How many in here thinks that they probably would have burnt up in the original furnace? I feel like if you're thrown into a furnace that you can't get out of, whether that furnace is regular heat or seven times hotter, you're probably going to have the same ending. So why seven times hotter? Why seven times hotter? What would take place in Nebuchadnezzar's heart? Why would that thought be in Nebuchadnezzar's heart to turn the furnace seven times hotter? They had used this furnace for this purpose before. He didn't just on a whim come up with the idea, hey, I got a thought, let's use punishment by throwing them into a furnace. I feel like they weren't the first three cast in that furnace due to punishment. Just like Jesus was, was the greatest example of somebody being crucified, they didn't come up with that idea for him. That was something that had been done before. 
but they turned the furnace seven times hotter. And in verse 22 of Daniel 3, it says, Therefore, because the king's was, command was urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let that marinate just for a moment. Now, the furnace at regular heat made an allowance for men to bring people to the edge. How it would have worked, it wasn't a furnace like we think, obviously, but it was an open furnace, and there was like a platform that would walk out to the edge, and they would carry these men out to the edge of what we would call a ramp, and then they would throw them into this furnace. Now, at regular heat, the men taking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in control. At seven times hotter, it killed the men that were taking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to throw them into the furnace. They dropped dead because of the heat. Somebody just got it. It wasn't Nebuchadnezzar's idea to crank the heat up seven times. It was God's idea for him to crank the heat up by seven times. Because God would not allow it to be said that man had control, that the enemy had control over what was taking place with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Can somebody say amen? Watch this. Watch this. So here's the scenario. There is a ramp. This is the furnace. This is the ramp. Men, by orders of the king, take the three Hebrew children, and when they get close to the furnace, they drop dead. <laughs> so here's the scenario. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are at the edge of the ramp. And the ones that were made to throw them in are dead on the ramp. Watch verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of of the burning, fiery furnace. Oh, hallelujah. Everyone say this with me. When you trust God, you're not afraid of the fire. Oh, hallelujah. That word fell. I'm not even going to attempt to tell you how to pronounce the original Hebrew word. But that word fell is much closer to the definition of fell and worshipped. Fell on his face before God. When the man that was filled with demons came and fell on his face before Jesus and worshipped him, it's the same root word as the word fell when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell into the furnace. Watch this. This is so wonderful. They're standing at the edge. Everyone there to throw them in is dead. But they have already said, if I go in, he will be with me. Oh, hallelujah. So then, they're standing there by themselves. They could have run or they could have stood there because nobody could get to them to throw them in the furnace because when they got close, they dropped dead because of the seven times hotter heat. But instead of running and instead of being afraid, they said, I've already declared that he'll be with me in the fire. And so they fell into the fire knowing that God was going to walk with them in the flames to declare and show forth the glory of their father. Can somebody lift your hands and give God praise? Wow, wow. They volunteered the fall. The Bible says they fell in. They weren't 
cast in. The plan was for them to cast them in, but they dropped dead on the ramp and they fell in. Hold it. Hold it. We get confused sometimes about what a step of faith is. Everyone say a step of faith. We think that a step of faith is walking blindly with the hope or the understanding that God will bail you out. That's not a step of faith. That's walking blindly with the hope that God will bail you out. A step of faith is an educated decision to make a move based on your intimate knowledge of who you serve. Oh, glory to God. Somebody needs to hear this, whether in person or online. Somebody needs to hear this. A step of faith is not blindly taking a leap and saying, you know what? I'm going to leap and make this decision or I'm going to leap and buy this or I'm going to leap and step into this in business and God will bail me out because he never leaves me. No, no, no. A step of faith is this is where I need to go. This is what I need to do. I'm making that step because I know the God that I serve and I'm not doing it blindly. I'm doing it educated, knowing that if I fall into that fire, if I haven't died yet, I'm not going to die when I get there. Can somebody lift your hands and give God praise? We have to understand that. We have to understand that because people often, people often, I've done it, you've done it. We do things, we, we make decisions, we call it a step of faith. And then when it doesn't work out, we can't figure out why, but I took a step of faith. No, you walked blindly hoping for God to bail you out. That might not have been the step he wanted you to take. But when you take the step that you have heard from God, when God has spoken into your heart to take a step of faith, or when his word has spoken to you, can, can I just tell you something? You don't need a prophetic word from a, pro, from a preacher or on TV or on the internet to ask for healing. Nobody has to come to you and say, thus saith the Lord, take a step of faith and believe for your healing. Because thus said the Lord, take a step of faith and believe for your healing. So when I take a step of faith and believe for healing, it's not a blind movement, it's an educated decision. Can somebody say amen? Are you receiving that this morning? It's an educated decision because I know who he is. And he said, ask anything in my name believing and you shall receive it. So I'm not taking a blind step of faith when I ask something in his name. I'm walking in the understanding of who God is. And see, the three Hebrew children had already declared, if you cast us into the furnace and that's the decision, that's fine, we'll go. Our God that we serve is able to deliver us out of the fiery furnace and deliver us from your hand. So what you have to understand is this. Everybody watching saw a fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saw an encounter with God. Do you understand the difference? They saw a moment where God was going to prove himself true. And they stepped in and they fell in. Not blindly, not uneducated, not wildly. They fell in because they had already declared that he would deliver. Oh my God, hear that. 
they had already spoken it into the atmosphere that God would deliver them. And they understood, once I've put it out there, God will back it up. And they fell into the furnace. Everyone said they fell into the furnace. Verse 24 of Daniel chapter 3. Here's what they learned when they got there. Hallelujah. Everyone say this with me. It'll shock you, the heat that I can handle. Every day, children of God face situations that they don't think they'd ever be able to make it through. Every day, children of God come up against battles that the enemy puts in their life that if somebody told you before you went to that battle that it would happen, you would swear that's something I could never survive. But it'll shock you with God how much heat you can handle. The enemy thinks that he can turn up the heat hot enough in your life to cause you to surrender. But what he doesn't realize is you are shielded from that heat and you will not surrender. Can somebody give him praise? First thing that they learned is it'll surprise you how much heat they can handle. Verse 24, the Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he arose in haste and spake saying to the counselors, did we not cast three men bound? Everyone say bound. Into the midst of the fire they answered and said, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose. Walking in the midst of the fire, they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. See, the enemy's got this mixed up. He thinks that putting you in the fire is going to burn you. The only thing that putting you in the fire does is burns off what's holding you back. That's it. Going through the fire, when you come out the other side, how many's ever been through a time of fire in your life and when you look back, you realize the fire didn't kill you. What you went through didn't kill you, but it made you stronger. And the things that were holding you back from victory had burnt off in that fire and you're more free now than you ever were. How many knows what I'm talking about? Hallelujah. I'll use myself as the example. Last year, we all know what took place. And when I was in the hospital and I came within a, a hair breath of being dead, God brought me through that. He healed me and he brought me out. And as I look back at it, I realized there was some things that were kind of wrapped around me that stayed in the hospital room. I came out, but some of that junk stayed in there because I began to realize who my father was in an even more intimate, powerful way and walking in his glory and in his faith and in his favor. Why? Because the fire couldn't burn me. It just burnt off some junk that I didn't need in my life in the first place. Can somebody lift your hands and give God praise? Hallelujah. 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 Most importantly, here's what you learn in the fire. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Look at the woman beside you and say, you ain't by yourself. Even if you don't like the word ain't, say it anyhow. You ain't by yourself. Heads up, your father's not going to faint and your mother's not going to drop in a bucket of paint if you say ain't. Only about three of you got that, but you'll be all right. You are not alone. One of the most powerful things that has ever been spoken in the word, in my opinion, is 
we put three men bound. Now there's four men loose. One of the most revelatory statements that a non-God-fearing man ever spoke was, we put three men bound, now there's four men loose. Huh. And he said, there's something about how the fourth man walks around in the fire. Everyone say the form. Oh, glory to God. He wasn't saying he looks like him. He wasn't saying he was built like him. He was talking form. He was talking form like a gymnast or a figure skater has great form. It's how they move. It's how they walk. It's how they operate. He said there's something about how the fourth man is walking in the flames. There's something about the confidence he moves with. The form of the fourth man is like unto the Son of God. He couldn't, he couldn't be meaning he looks like him. He'd never seen him. He didn't mean his hair looks like him. He'd never seen him. He said there's something about his form that is like the Son of God. Everybody else that has ever went in the furnace, the flames chase them. This guy walks in the furnace and the flames try to escape him. There's something about how he moves in the flame. You have to hear this because you have to understand that when the Son of God is walking with you in what you're walking in, the enemies that are trying to destroy you are instinctively trying to get away from him because they know who he is. Can somebody give God glory? Hallelujah. When the man was stuck in the tombs and he was filled with demons and they tried to bind him and the people, every time he would break free, the people would put him back in chains and they put him on display to show, hey, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. And they put him out on display. The Bible says Jesus just stepped off of the boat. He didn't preach. He didn't give an altar call. He didn't sing a worship song. He just stepped off of the boat. And there was so Something in how he moved when he stepped off of the boat, the demons that were controlling that man knew this guy is different than everybody else that has ever landed on this shore. And what did they do? He came and fell before him and worshiped him, and they begged Jesus, Why have you come to torment us? I just got off the boat, man. I just, I just, I'm on my way somewhere. I just landed here. No, 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 no. They said, everywhere you go, you send us elsewhere. Why have you come to torment us? And they were so desperate to get away from Jesus. They said, is it possible that we could go live in the pigs? See, the enemy... Oh, hallelujah. Lift your hand just for a second. Hmm. The enemy wants you to feel like what you're facing is doing the chasing. The enemy wants you to feel like you're on the run from something. That you're trying to escape from something. That you're trying to get away from something. That sickness is chasing you. That poverty is chasing you. That depression is chasing you. That anxiety is after you. And you have to be one step ahead of it all the time. And you have to be fighting to gain ground all the time. Because if not... It will overtake you. But somebody hear me. When you are walking with the Son of God, it's not chasing you. It's trying to escape from you. That's why it hurts so bad. That's why the enemy fights so hard. 
He's trying to escape from you. He's more afraid of you than you are of him. Are you hearing me this morning? The thing that I have learned in the fire is that the enemies all all talk. And if I can block out what he's saying, he can't defeat me. Oh, glory to God. Are you hearing me? If I can block out what he's trying to put in here and in here and in here, he can't defeat me because he's not in charge. He's not in charge. He's trying to intimidate you and he's trying to scare you out of making a move. He's trying to scare you out of taking a step of faith. He's trying to scare you out of what you know God wants in your life. He's trying to scare you into surrendering your body to him, surrendering your finances to him, surrendering your peace to him. He's trying to scare you into it. But when you can block out the words that he is speaking to you, you will understand it's not a cliche. It's a declaration. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It's not just a cute song and it's not a cliche. It's for real. Greater is he that is in you, walking with you in your fire than he. Who's he? Anybody. And anything that is in the world. I can't lose when I block him out. Oh, hallelujah. Can we stand together for a moment this morning? I say this a lot, but I think it bears repeating. Satan has a lot of weapons. A lot of weapons that he will try to use against you. He's only got two that can have any success. He's only got two that can have success, and they can only have success when we surrender. Everyone say fear and intimidation. That's it. That's it. How do I know? Because he has given us power over all powers of the enemy. I don't care what anybody tries to tell you or what anybody tries to convince you so that you'll just accept the circumstances you're in. You have power over sickness. You have power over disease. You've been given power over depression and anxiety. You've been given power over over poverty. You've been given power over all powers of darkness. The only way the enemy can truly defeat you is in a moment you forget that and surrender to what he's saying. Why do you think it's so important to block out negative voices in your life. Hallelujah. Why do you think it's so important for you to block out your own negative voice in your life? I don't know if you realize this or not. It might come as a revelation to somebody. But when you speak, you hear what you speak. And if you speak doubt and acceptance and negativity into your life, it's going to seep into here and it's going to seep into here. I'm not talking about the power of positive thinking. I'm talking about the power of the word of God and declaring it in your life and understanding that Satan has no authority over you. Can somebody give him praise? If he's given you all power over all powers of the enemy... He's not just blowing smoke. He's given you that authority. Amen. And the only thing that will back you down is if the enemy puts fear in you. Amen. 
It's why when David first saw Goliath, he wasn't ready to fight him. He had to go back to the wilderness for 40 days while Goliath presented himself. When he was in the wilderness, he had to conquer fear and intimidation when he defeated the lion and the bear. Then when he came back to fight Goliath, he was like, I'm not afraid and you don't intimidate me. I'm going to feed your flesh to the fowls of the air. Everything you said you were going to do to me, I'm about to do to you. Why? Because he knew who he Oh, glory to God. Can we just love him for a moment this morning? I love that. I love that when they came out of the fire, they didn't even smell like smoke. <laughs> Anybody ever burnt your hair before? Well, there's some people probably... It actually looks like a couple may have burnt it really bad. <laughs> Live to tell about <laughs> I pastored a church one time and we had a big furnace, a big wood furnace, and that's how we heated everything. And one night I couldn't get the fire going. It was about 1230. I probably could have if I had been patient, but I wasn't patient in the moment. So I just put all the wood and put all the kindling, put everything in there. And then I had a 7-Eleven cup about this big, and I just filled it with gas. And I went... <laughs> and I smelled something really strange. And I went salt and pepper, just like that. Singed all the front of my hair. And I wasn't in the furnace, I was just next to it when the flame shot out. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked around in it, didn't singe a hair on their head, didn't touch their clothing, and they didn't even smell like smoke. Why? Because when you're not afraid of Nebuchadnezzar, and the fire doesn't scare you, and you know that the sun is walking with you, None of these things will move you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the fire, I learned that. I didn't learn that when everything was going good. I learned that when all hell was breaking loose in my life and the enemy said, I'm going to take you out. That's when I learned he actually technically doesn't have the authority to take me out. That's when I learned he's all show and no go. And when I put him in his place and let him know that I know he is a liar and cannot speak the truth. So if he tells you you're going down, what a time to rejoice. Because it's opposite day always in the devil's kingdom. He can't speak the truth. He can't speak the truth. Hallelujah. Do not allow doubt and confusion and fear enter into your moment. Oh, let's praise him this morning. Just, just while you're praying, just while you're praying, just while you're praying, I want you to declare in your words, not mine, but I want you to declare into your circumstance and your situation that you know who's walking with you. That you know the devil is a liar. Hallelujah. That you block out. Father, I just put a, I put a God filter on every person in here's ears and mind and thoughts and heart that you would filter out every moment of doubt and confusion and fear, that you would block out every lie of the enemy that would say you're not going to make it, it's not going to happen, you're not going to survive this, you're not going to make it through this, you're going to stay sick, you're going to stay broke, you're going to stay discouraged. I 
curse every lie of the enemy that would speak into the minds of your people. I block it out. He has given us power over all powers. Satan does not have the authority in your life. Oh, we need to praise him this morning. We ought to take a second and praise him. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. This isn't small stuff we're talking about. This is life-changing understanding to understand. No matter what he says, he doesn't have the say over your life. Hallelujah. And when you are walking with the Son of God, pause, time out. Things have adjusted since Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now we don't just walk with the Son of God. We are the sons of God. So when we walk, it is him walking. And when we speak, it is him speaking. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. What manner of love has the Father bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God? When I open my mouth, he who is in me speaks. That's what the enemy hears. And you are victorious. You are victorious. Let's love him as we close in prayer this morning. I want you to marinate on that thought this week. I want you to declare in every situation, every decision you're making, every step you're taking, every moment you're facing from here until you get back in the house of God or from here until eternity. I want you to marinate on the thought, you have the final say. You've been given it by the word of God. Satan doesn't have the authority. Father, we just declare the name of Jesus. Oh, lift up your voice and praise him, would you, this morning? We've done this already, but we declare that every word of the enemy is a lie. Every lie that the devil would tell to try to block, try to hinder, try to postpone, try to delay what we are doing in our lives, trying to delay healing, trying to delay peace, trying to delay blessing, trying to, to interject discouragement and anxiety, trying to interject pain and sickness and poverty and disease. I break every lie of the enemy and I declare that God is true and the enemy is a liar. I block out every voice that would speak no. I block out every voice that would declare that God's not going to do it this time for he has promised that he will do it this time. He is in me, working through me. So everywhere I go, he is there. And we declare his eternal presence in my life in the name of Jesus. Where I speak, he speaks. Where I move, he moves. And I stay inside of his word. The enemy does not have access or ability or authority to reverse what God has said. That's why we can declare healing over everyone in this place. There are those that are not here this morning because of sickness in their body. I send the word of God in the name of Jesus and I declare them healed. Every pain, every discomfort, every symptom be gone. Let the cause of the symptom be evaporated and let them walk in your healing. We speak across this place and to those that are watching at home. And I just declare over the lives of people that are watching this morning or people that are here. The enemy doesn't have the authority to stop what God is doing in your life. It is done in Jesus' name. It is done in Jesus' name. Can we lift a hand and love him this morning? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Dave, would you come and just close in prayer for us this morning? Just stretch your hands and give God glory. Father, I thank you this morning for the power of your word, the words of life, Lord, that just rein us in 
And help us, Lord God, to realize that, that you are our guidance. You are our support. You are our strength. You are our answer, Lord. And I'm reminded when Jesus got into the boat and he said to the disciples, we're going to the other side, and he went to sleep. But the storms, the other voices that we all face, Lord, that want to intimidate, that want to harass, that want to deceive us, Lord, they buffeted those disciples until they lined up with Jesus again. And Lord, may we, in the storms of our lives, recognize that connecting, focused, directly following, adhering to the commands and the word of God, Lord, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We, that, uh, we can do all things through Christ who gives us the strength. And so, Lord, thank you for blessing us, Lord, with the truth in your word. And, Lord, we block out every other voice, no matter where it comes from. And we keep our eyes on you. Thank you for that restful experience in each one of our spirits. Because we know, God, you have set us under the word this morning. We have heard truth, and Lord, we thank you for your word that will never pass away. Guide and direct us this week, and give us victory, Lord, through all the challenges we face. May we do so knowing that we're going to the other side, because Jesus is with us in our boats. And for this we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think if I'm not mistaken, we have some...